are in place by Vandaloria and Daniel Wildcat. We are on page 22, chapter 3, and here we go. <clears throat> <clears throat> so we have different paths to the same conclusions, keeping the particular in mind as the ultimate reference point of Indian knowledge. We can pass into a discussion of some of the principles of the Indian forms of knowledge. Here, power and place are dominant concepts. Power being the living energy that inhabits and slash or composes the universe, and place being the relationship of things to each other. It is much easier in discussing Indian principles to put these basic ideas into, the, into a simple equation. Power and place produce personality. This equation simply means that the universe is alive, and it, is all, and it also contains within it the very important suggestion that the universe is personal, and therefore must be approached in a personal manner. And this insight holds true because these, blah, 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 this insight holds true because Indians are interested in the particular, in the particular, <laughs> And this insight holds true because Indians are interested in the particular, which of necessity must be personal and incapable of expansion and projection to hold true universally. <clears throat> the personal nature of the universe demands that each and every entity in it seek and sustain personal relationships. Here, the Indian theory of relativity is much more comprehensive than the corresponding theory articulated by Einstein and his fellow scientists. The broader Indian idea of relationship in a universe that is very personal and particular suggests that all relationships have a moral content. For that reason, Indian knowledge of the universe was never separated from other sacred knowledge about ultimate spiritual realities. The spiritual aspect of knowledge about the world taught the people that relationships must not be left incomplete. There are many stories about how the world came to be, and the common themes running through them are the completion of relationships and the determination of how this world should function. Such tales seem far removed from the considerations of science, particularly as Indian students are taught science in today's universities. However, when the tribal concepts are translated into scientific language, they make a good deal of sense. Completing the relationship focuses the individual's attention on the results of his or her actions. Thus, the Indian people were concerned about the products of what they did, and they sought to anticipate the con and consider all possible effects of their actions. <clears throat> this uh, paragraph is called End on Appropriateness. The corresponding question faced by American Indians when contemplating action is whether or not the proposed action is appropriate. Appropriateness includes the moral dimension of respect for the part of nature that will be used or affected in our action. Thus, killing an animal or catching a fish involved paying respect to the species and the individual animal or fish that such action had disturbed. Harvesting plants also involved paying respect to the plants. These actions were necessary because of the recognition that the universe was built upon constructive and cooperative relationships that had to be maintained. Thus, ceremonies such as the first salmon and buffalo dance and the strawberry festivals and the corn dances celebrated and completed relationships properly or ensured their continuance for future generations. We can view this different perspective in yet another way that will speak more directly to the Indian students studying Western science. Very early, at least beginning with the Greek speculation on the nature of the world, the Western peoples seem to have accepted a strange binary system of reasoning in which things are compared primarily according to their size and shape. Out of this perspective came the natural sciences as we have them today. Eventually, distinctions were made primarily on the basis of shape, and from this tendency came the great theory of evolution that now reigns in the, in the West. 
<clears throat> All our knowledge of the natural world, world within the Western framework derives from a crude comparison between skeletons of animals. Very little knowledge exists about the animals themselves except relative bone structures. We only speculate on how they see the world, think, and understand emotional experiences. Increasingly, studies show them to have a complete and emotional slash intelligible intellectual life as we do. American Indians seem to have considered this kind of thinking at one time because there are tribal stories comparing humans to various animals. The stories always emphasize that while humans cannot see as well as hawks, they can see. They are not as strong as the bear, but they are strong. Not as fast as the deer, but they can run and so forth. However, when these comparisons are carefully analyzed, one finds that both physical and psychological characteristics are described. Indians derive their knowledge of birds and animals from actual experiences, and therefore physical structure meant little to them as they anticipated encountering these creatures in the future and needed to know how they behaved for hunting and protection purposes. Thus, Charles Eastman was taught that when approached by a bear or a mountain lion, one should pick up a stick immediately so that the animal would think he was, uh, he was armed and dangerous. When using plants as both medicines and foods, Indians were very careful to use the plant appropriately by maintaining the integrity of the plant within the relationship. Indians discovered many important facts about the natural world that non-Indians only came up later. The Senecas, for example, knew that corn, squash, and beans were the three sisters of the earth. And because they had a place in the world and were compatible spirits, the Indians always planted them together. Only recently have non-Indians, after decades of laboratory research, discovered that the three plants make a natural nitrogen cycle that keeps, them, that keeps land fertile and productive. Plants, because they have their own life cycles, taught Indians about time. George Brill and George Hyde, in their book, in their book Corn Among the Indians of the Upper Missouri, pointed out that it was the practice of the agricultural tribes to plant their corn. Hoe it, in a few, hoe it a few times, and then depart for the western mountains on their summer buffalo hunt. When a certain plant in the west began to change its color, the hunters knew it was time to return home to harvest their corn. This knowledge about corn and the manner in which its growth cycle correlated with that of the plants of the mountains some 500 miles away was very sophisticated and involved the idea of time as something more complex than mere chronology. <clears throat> chronology. Time was also growth of all beings toward maturity. This chapter is called Star Knowledge. Much Indian knowledge involved the technique of reproducing the cosmos in miniature and invoking spiritual change, which would be followed by physical change. Hardly a tribe exists that did not construct its, did not construct its dwellings after some particular model of the universe. <clears throat> the principle involved was that whatever is above must be reflected below. This principle enabled the people to correlate their actions with the larger movements of the universe. Wherever possible, the larger cosmos was represented and reproduced to provide a context in which ceremonies could occur. Thus, people did not feel alone. They participated in cosmic rhythms. Star knowledge was among the most secretive and sophisticated of all the information that Indians possessed. Today, archaeoastronomers are finding all kinds of correlations between Indian practices and modern astro astronomical knowledge. Very complex star maps painted on buckskin hides or chiseled on canyon walls give the evidence that Indians were astute observers of the heavens and their ceremonial activities were often based on the movement of the heavens. A good deal of Indian star knowledge continues to exist, but religious prohibitions and restrictions still limit the propagation of this information. Some star knowledge goes very far back into the past when the sky looked different. The Sioux said there, are one, there were, was once a bright star in the middle of the Big Dipper. Today we can, suggest, we can suggest that the black hole does not properly exist there. This chapter is called The Principle of Correlation. Star knowledge gives us an additional principle of Indian information gathering. 
That principle is correspondence or correlation being interested in the psychological behavior of things in the world and attributing personality to all things. Indians began to observe and remember how and when things happened together. <clears throat> the result was that they made connections between things that had, no that had no sequential relationships. There was, consequently, no firm belief in cause and effect, which plays such an important role in Western science and thinking. But Indians were well aware that when a certain sequence of things began, certain other elements or events would also occur. A kind of predictability was, pre was present in Indian knowledge of the natural world. Many ceremonies that are used to find things, heal, or predict the future rely upon this kind of correlation between and among entities in the world. The so-called medicine powers and medicine bundles represented this kind of correlated understanding of how different things were related to each other. Correlation is responsible, for example, for designating the bear as a medicine animal, owls as forecasting death or illness, and snakes as anticipating thunderstorms. This kind of knowledge is both tribal and environmental, environmental specific. In diagnosing illness, for example, medicine people might search for the cause of sickness by questioning their patients on a variety of apparently unrelated experiences. They would be searching for the linkages, linkages that experience had taught them existed in these situations. Here again, there was considerable emphasis on the heavens. One need only examine the admonitions of different tribes with respect to shooting stars. Different configurations of the moon, eclipses, and unusual cloud formations to understand how correlation knowledge provided unique ways of adjusting to the natural world. <clears throat> this, this chapter is called A More Realistic Knowledge. The Indian method of observing produces a more realistic knowledge in the sense that, given the anticipated customary course of events, the Indian knowledge can predict what will probably occur. Western science seeks to harness nature to perform certain tasks. But there are limited resources in the natural world, and artificial and wasteful use depletes the resource more rapidly than would otherwise occur naturally. The acknowledgement that power in place produce personality means not only that the natural world is personal, but that its perceived relationships are always ethical. For that reason, Indian accumulation of knowledge is directly opposed to the Western scientific method of investigation, because it, because it is primarily observation. Indians look for messages in nature, but they do, but they do not force nature to perform, perform functions that it does not naturally do. Indian students can expect to have a certain amount of difficulty in adjusting to the scientific way of doing things. They will most certainly miss, Indian, miss the Indian concern with ethical questions and the sense of being personally involved in the functions of the natural world. But they can overcome this feeling and bring to science a great variety of insights about the world, about the world derived from their own tribal backgrounds and traditions. They must always keep in mind that traditional knowledge of their people was derived from centuries, perhaps millennia, of experience. Thus, stories that seem incredible when compared with scientific findings may indeed represent that unique event that occurs once, an, once a century and is not likely to be repeated. Western knowledge, on the other hand, is so well controlled by doctrine that it often denies experiences that could provide important data for consideration. By adopting the old Indian concern with the products of actions, students can get a much better perspective on what they are doing and how best to accomplish their goals. Their goal goals. By maintaining a continuing respect for the beliefs and practices of their tribes, students can begin to see the world through the eyes of their ancestors and translate the best knowledge of the world into acceptable modern scientific terminology. Most important, however, are the contributions being made by American Indian scientists. With their expertise, we can better frame our own ethical and religious concerns and make more constructive choices in the use of existing Indian physical and human resources. 
It is this linkage between science and the community that we must nurture and encourage. We must carry the message that the universe is indeed a personal one. It may indeed be a spiritual universe that has taken on physical form and not a universe of matter that has accidentally produced a personality. This chapter is chapter four called Understanding the Crisis in American Education. <clears throat> Maybe we do live in an information in an information age. In fact, it would seem reasonable to say we are witnessing an information revolution, and as heretical as it may as this may sound, it may be a large part of most disturbing problems we see surrounding us today. The so-called information highway may be a curious phenomenon, but it is amazing that almost no one stops to inquire as to where it is taking us. I heard an elder once remark, if you don't know where you are going, any road will get you there. This modest insight may sum up better than any national Indian education reports, panels, or committees the crisis of not just Indian education today, but education in America. Today what counts as knowledge in mainstream education is too often short-term memorization of facts. What counts as understanding is specialization in a narrow topic within a field or discipline. Understanding is, is so narrowly framed that it is often difficult for the specialists, let alone students, to effectively connect or relate their knowledge and understanding to the everyday lives of non-scientists. Because people desire just the facts without any understanding of the relations and connections between the facts and the rest of the world, we have the search engine model of education. Faster, more powerful, and increasingly smaller computers, though, through, uh, though great at processing data and performing quantitative, nat quantitative analysis, cannot tell us what the data mean. We are drowning in information. The bits and pieces of dot, of dot, dot com mini 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 <laughs> that more often than not are advertisements and, amuse and amusements swimming in knowledge, the organized insights into highly specialized aspects of the phenomenal world, significant parts of our experience, I'll bet at various depths and dying for thirst for what Deloria calls understanding. And I would call wisdom a big picture, a worldview in which information and knowledge are integrated meaningfully. Deloria's discussion of American Indian notions of knowledge and understanding remind us that ultimately, understanding or wisdom ought to be the goal of education. Lest this point be misunderstood, computers, the World Wide Web, and technology are not necessarily the problem. All the above are quite simply tools, material and technological aspects of modern industrial societies. However, Unlike prior technological innovations in human history, whose applications and, impl and implications seem relatively obvious within specific environments, e.g. the bow, the block, the tackle, the, sap the saddle and stirrup, etc., <clears throat> information technology today seems little understood in terms of environmental and cultural contexts. Although one might think information technology, especially in the light of its service toward what is often referred to as globalization, cannot possibly serve indigenous peoples and their places. However, the Global Learning and Observations to Benefit the Environment Project, environment project and, envi and Experiential and Inquiry-Based Educational Use of the World Wide Web suggests there might be reason for some optimism. Imagine indigenous school children from Malaysia and Altai, mountains of Siberia, of Siberia and the desert southwest going out into the homelands and experientially learning about their environments, collecting their own data and learning how to analyze their data by doing, by doing, as opposed to being taught about science. More importantly, the Internet and World Wide Web may in fact give indigenous people around the world the opportunity to compare notes on what is happening in their homelands and, even more significantly, discuss what their observations mean. 
The heart of the problem facing Indian education in America is found in the, in the largely abstract metaphysics of time, space, and energy. Western metaphysics yields a very different conception of reality than an experiential American Indian metaphysics of place and power. One, one crucial difference in two metaphysics is that the Western concepts presume to objectively describe the world at the expense of taking for, of taking for granted, or at least leaving undeveloped, is issues and questions regarding the nature of reality, that is, what Deloria calls the personality of the human beings during the conceptualizing. <clears throat> <clears throat> it is the philosophical equivalent of a radar scan for which the subject, the conceptualizer, and intellectual model builder is off the screen as off the screen and not even registering as a blip. It is a symptomatic of the problems symptomatic of the problems of modern Western thought, and specifically science, that one has to look back to Socrates over two millennia before Immanuel Kant, Kant, G.F.W. Hegel, Ralph Waldo Emerson, William James, and John Dewey place the problem of human consciousness and spirit back into the debate between ideal, idealist and realist metaphysics. Only when modern Western psychology, social psychology, and, so and sociology are born is the problem of, per of personhood or the subject picked on on metaphysical radar of Western science. This fact alone is very symbolic of the major weakness of the Western metaphysics of time, space, and energy. The Western metaphysics of science make identifying of things and some basic interactions related easy to identify. However, it provides almost no enlightenment regarding living relationships, processes between subjects, and the formation of what Deloria calls personalities, be they plants, animals, or geo geologic geologic and geographic features of the world where we reside. Deloria's proposal that we explore an indigenous, in this case American Indian, metaphysics must be among the first projects American Indian educators undertake if we are to not only decolonize, but also actively indigenize and truly make native education, educational institutions our own. American Indians have a long history of rejecting abstract theories and metaphysical systems in place of experiential, of experiential systems properly called indigenous. Indigenous in the sense that people historically and culturally connected to the places can and do draw on power located in those places. Stated simply, indigenous, indigenous means to be of a place. The, the oratories of Tecumseh, Ten Bears, Sitting Bull, and Chief Joseph, to name but a few letters, speak eloquently to this point. Indigenous people represent a culture emergent from a place and they actively draw on the power of that place physically and spiritually. Indigenism, as discussed here, is a body of thought advocating and elaborating diverse cultures in their broadest, in their broadest sense. For example, behavior, beliefs, values, symbols, and material products emerge from diverse places. To indigenize an action or object is the act of making something of a place. The active process of making culture in its broadest sense of a place is called indigenization. Kajete's work, Look Into the Mountain, should be, should be a required re reading for all teachers wanting to indigenize their pedagogy and curriculum and provide a framework for students to explore meaning in their life experiences. Western scientists and engineers are good at identifying the pieces, parts, and things in the world this is commonly what we refer to as knowledge, as, as knowledge, a set of technical beliefs, and I would add skills, which, upon mastering, admit the pupil to the social and, econ and economic structures of the large society. Jacques Alou's observation of nearly four decades ago, the technological society, that even the modern way of thinking has become technical or technology-shaped today seems uh, prescient. Institutions of the larger society provide little support for the emotional and spiritual development of individuals. 
Toka Toqueville remarked in the 1830s that he was amazed that a society so deeply committed to, to diversity of opinion and free thought had so little of either. He also identified the real danger of American democracy as the tendency for Americans to become preoccupied with their individual economic gain that little time remained for direct participation in public life or community. He seems to have been on target, for in American education the purposes seem less and less about shaping responsible and respectful persons and more about, as Deloria says, the training of professionals. The absence in formal education today, <clears throat> education today of the discussion of meaning or awareness of the emergence of meaning in our lives shows the success of a metaphysics that uncritically and now most part unconsciously shapes education for all Americans. And, as Deloria points out, science will leave the questions of meaning to those institutions that appear to scientists as the embodiment of fuzzy or unclear thinking. <clears throat> the discipline of psychology and slash or the social institution of religion. <clears throat> Understand in the context of Western metaphysics, as portrayed by Deloria, it is easy to understand the necessary separation in modern Western thought between science and religion and psychology. In all, in all but its most reductionist biochemical versions. <clears throat> the deep opposition in Western thought between science and religion is the most critical and fundamental obstacle to to integrating modern science and the American Indian wisdom born of an experiential metaphysics. Our ancient native understanding begins with the necessary task, the problematic, of establishing what Deloria calls our personality, who we are. Learning comes early in indigenous institutions, not through lectures but through experience, customs, habits, and practices. The primary lesson learned is and was the knowledge and understanding come from our relatives and other persons or beings we have relationships with and depend on in order to live. And it is through these relationships, physical and psychological, indeed spiritual, that human beings begin to understand who, why, and even to some degree what we are. A value-free, neutral, objective science of things cannot give us that. And it is this discovery of meaning through very complex relationships that this the hallmark of American Indian education. Given Western metaphysical term systems, as Delory has described them, it is fitting and predictable that many learned persons in Western civilization today are concerned about finding a solution to the energy crisis they created. Make no mistake about it, technology alone is, ne is neither the problem nor the solution. The real issue is how we live in modern industrial societies. Yet it is obvious that the citizens of modern industrial and or post-industrial societies are lacking the wherewithal withal to solve the problem. The problem is not finding, renewing, conserving, or producing more energy, and the solution is not another cutting-edge technology from the standpoint of American Indian metaphysics of power in place. The problem is not something called energy. <clears throat> but more realistically, about power and place we live, basically how we live. We should not underestimate the deep-seated roots of the problem. Where do we start? At the beginning. This is the approach Deloria took nearly four decades ago with the publication of God is Red, and I believe remains the best approach. We need a generation or two of articulate American Indian philosophers, scientists, and engineers learning rather than being taught lessons our elders can demonstrate for us, right where they live. I believe science is moving from a me mechanistic reductionist model to a holistic nonlinear or complexity model science view. Consequently, it seems re reasonable to speak of a convergence of new scientific theories and understanding with what I would call indigenous North American worldviews and intellectual traditions. The hypothesis I challenge scientists, engineers, historians of science, and ethno ethnographers to explore 
is the extent to which much of the so-called new knowledge and understanding of complexity, nonlinear systems, and emergence resides in American Indian tribal customs, habits, and social organization, the way we lived and live. Here, the use of a concept of habitude seems worth consideration. Seems worth, seems worth consideration. Although a dictionary of modern English usage may see the world habitude as superfluous, super, superfluous and synonymous with habit, I believe is I believe it's justified with when considered as an attitude or awareness of a deep system of experiential relations on which the world is building or living. The key here is recognizing that experience is the undeveloped and untheorized site where the divisions between subjective and objective material and spiritual and the and an entire series of dichotomies disappear. Too many of us who are part of tribes with clan systems, an obvious example of what I mean by habitude, is the understanding one acquired as a part of a clan-based social system. Knowledge first and later an understanding that the clan system not only indicated a certain amount, a certain tribal human organization, but also actually existed as a symbolic representation of ecology and environment that we human beings were and are part of. <clears throat> Learning through custom and habit, a tribe's clan structures and societal roles and responsibilities conveyed a significant amount of knowledge. It is not only possible to figuratively lay out cl the clans of various tribes, for example, the plants, animals, features of the natural world, and material objects represented in clans, in clan names, totems, and interclan relations, and actually produce a report about where and how people lived. It is necessary to do so in order to understand the comprehensive nature of their geographic and ecological knowledge. <clears throat> A good example from the southeastern United States would be a comparison of the Cherokee clan system to the Yuchi clan system. The Yuchi share a large number of clans with the Seminole, but we both have a clan that the mountainous Cherokee do not possess. Knowledge of where the Seminole and Yuchi historically reside resided solves the puzzle. The Seminole living in the rich wetlands of South and Central Florida and the Yuchi who settled along the shores of the Savannah River but hunted throughout the Southeast and into Northern Florida have alligator clans and the Cherokee do not. Considering where both tribes lived, it is clear why the Seminole and Yuchi knowledge acknowledge an important relationship with an animal species that the Cherokee do not. <clears throat> Looking at the interfaces between our indigenous customs, habits, and ceremonies, and our identity, spiritual being, and the natural world, it is clear that a rich repository of knowledge exists that, sub that suburban com commuters, commuters cannot download from the internet. The general public has so divorced their lives from places, environments, and living ecosystems that it is easy to understand the ignorant questions often asked about American Indians. For example, why is the Ameri what is the American Indian religion? Well, for whom, which American Indians were, yes, the Yuchi lived on the river, but we did not have a salmon ceremony. Native people of the eastern Chesapeake Bay re region never had a buffalo, never had buffalo ceremonies. <clears throat> it is obvious when we consider the symbolic aspects of our cultures, ceremonial life, and even the social organization, the clan systems and special societies we created in our tribal communities, that these all contained accurate empirical information about how our ancestors lived in relationships with, e with real ecosystems and environments. In fact, I would suggest that there is, knowledge and there is knowledge contained in these cultural practices that modern science cannot acquire using a mechanist and dissective approach especially when the Western idea of universal objective truth reduces itself to abstract mathematical formulas. <clears throat> Western science is very good at that, but contrast this knowledge system and its product to one where knowledge claims literally emerge from a place 
and emergence in the world. This kind of knowledge will be fundamentally different from the knowledge produced through laboratory experiment or dissection. You see and hear things by being in a forest, on a river, or at an ocean coastline. You gain real experiential knowledge that you cannot see by looking at the thing at the beings that live in those environments and under a microscope or in a laboratory experiment. You experience places and learn if attentive and learn if attentive about processes and relationships in those places. When we start examining issues of complexity, emergence, and principles of self-organization, the biological phenomena of more morphological or structural change within species, all of that knowledge is perfectly and completely consistent with indigenous worldviews. Our ancestors understood that the world is a dynamic and living place. I am not aware of any native tradition that do not, as a part of their oral histories, accept that change uh, changes have occurred over time, often in a very short time sequence, catastrophic and other and otherwise. Some are more formal about this than others. Hopi and Diné traditions have very explicit discussions about the different stages of creation that have occurred. The fundamental notion is that the world and its entire biosphere is a dynamic living system. This insight, of course, leads to the recognition that traditional ecological knowledge knowledge culture, e.g. language, tools, clothing, technology, etc., in non-industrial or non-modern societies is emergent from the specific places of the planet. Throughout Africa, Asia, and Pan-Pacific Rim, and the end to the homelands of our brothers and sisters in the South and Central America, traditional native people possess personalities and culture born of places. The power we possess as Potawatomi Potawatomi, Ute, Abenaki, Salish, Lummi, as indigenous peoples, is found in places even today. The power we still possess, although it is constantly threatened and in many peoples greatly impoverished, expresses itself in an attitude of humility, humility and moral integrity still found, still found most often in our elders. Not only wisdom sits in places, as Keith Basso reminds us in his work on the Western Apache, but so does power and personality. This realization offers a powerful way of talking about the manner in which biological diversity and cultural diversity are intimately connected. It requires recognition that the culture is an emergent property, that is, a reality resulting from a complex processes containing a multitude of, of interactions. In short, cultures have causes, but not the kind most biologists or social scientists can easily test in a laboratory or replicate in linear causal models. Because the world we inhabit is a very diverse place, we ought to understand what nearly all American Indian worldviews readily acknowledge. Cultural diversity is not an issue of political correctness, but it is a geographic, historical, and biological reality. Recognizing this point highlights the most devastating feature of the Western worldview in its general character and practical application the destruction notion already forming by the time Cristobal Colon Columbus arrived in the Caribbean islands that Europeans possessed the truth and that it was their job to make sure all people they met on the planet were shown the truth. This confidence, initially betrayed by the domination of the church, that Western civilization represented the highest development of humankind was central to the Western worldview. The mandate to do things the way they did, pray the way they did, and virtually live the way they did was and sadly remains symptomatic of the extent to which the Western worldview of learned Europeans was already an abstract time-based ideology. They literally could not understand any history other than their own because their history became and was understood as the world history. If one understands this Western self-conscious faith in one 
abstract universal truths, and two, the European moral duty to remake the world in accordance with these truths in their own image, then the incredible force of these ideas explain much of the human history for the last 500 years. The worldview shaped by this twofold faith precluded recognition of knowledge, understanding, and power residing in places. It informs the practices of colonialism yesterday and today, and it suggests just how important cultural diversity is to the life of the planet and its people. <clears throat> Before Hegel, the preeminent modern idealist, developed his ideas of the world of the world spirit. Kant had written two telling essays, Idea of the Universal History of the Cosmopolitan Intent and What is Enlightenment. Both essays signal very clearly the profoundly in interior nature of the world Kant lived in and the extent to which reason, i.e. i.e. rationality, history, progress, and enlightenment itself were understood as embodiments in the world and reflected in the modern Western worldview. The manifestation of European enlightenment, ideal, enlightenment idealism in the institutions of Western Europe had a very dark side on that Nezetsi, Dewey, Marx, and the Frankfurt School of Critical Theorists all saw in one respect or another that, but that indigenous peoples all over the world experienced. Again, it matters little if you were, are, in Asia, Africa, South America, or Malaysia. The treatment of native peoples around the world is an ex post facto demonstration of the Western linear idea of history, where Western Europeans understood themselves to be at the cutting edge of history, with everybody else requiring instruction to be brought up to speed. This idea, so informative of European colonialism, was and is pure ideology, and if turnabout is fair play, the best example of what we Indians would call modern Western mythology. Western European colonizers were not tolerant of people who refused their instruction. This is still a living history. It is not a contentious claim. Contentious claim. By the time of the American and French revolutions, those few Europeans receiving a formal education had been taught that way. That way of living signaled the highest development of human potential as could exist in this world. While such talk has ended in this age of political correctness, the walk has not. Western inspired institutions continue to walk, behave, the old Western way. Just ask indigenous peoples throughout the world who are often fighting to keep from being trampled over. It is not enough to simply correct oral histories, study the language, and learn the tool-making procedures, and know the arts and crafts of indigenous societies. All of this is being done and ought to be done, but we must explore experiential living in the world. Unless we incorporate features of our cultures into a holistic and integrated indigenous process of education, what we produced is most likely educational tokenism. What we, will, what we still possess, amazingly, not as individuals, but as members of tribes, not nation states, is big picture wisdom born of experience, not pedo, pedological, pedological indoctrination. The work ahead of us is at once exciting and daunting. The task is daunting. For to a great extent, we must undertake something our ancestors never had the necessity, opportunity, or wherewithal to undertake. An explicit discussion about the metaphysical foundation underlying our diverse indigenous worldviews. The work is exciting because it plays to our strengths, customs, habits, values, and how we live as indigenous people. Not in some romanticized ideal or abstract past, but in the world power and place equally equal personality. Deloria's formation is founded in experience in the world. A good place to begin Indian education in America is with the lived experiences of people 
A good place to begin Indian education in America is with the lived experiences of peoples who have resided in places long enough to know and remember what it means to be native to a place. This is chapter five. It's called Knowing and Understanding. <clears throat> Modern American education is a major domestic industry. With the collapse of the Cold War, education may well become the industry of the American future. Indeed, in the 2000 election, both candidates stressed education because education significantly impacts Indian communities and has exerted great influence among, among Indians from the very beginning of European contact it is our duty to draw back from the incessant efforts to program educational opportunities and evaluate what we are doing and where we are going in this field. <clears throat> it should come as no surprise to people in Indian communities that in the recent months, one report on Indian community colleges has been released and plans have been announced to conduct yet another study on what is happening in Indian education. We seem to occupy the curious position of being pilot projects and exper experimental subjects for one group of educators and the last communities to receive educational benefits as determined by another set of educators, primarily administrators. So the time has come to try and make sense of what, an, uh, what education has been, presently is, and conceivable might be for American Indians. Though Western science has been personified by Western peoples themselves, as Dr. Fratus, Dr. Faustus, Dr. Frankenstein, and Dr. Strangelove, the person who steps aside the boundary of acceptable behavior and becomes a monster and a threat to humankind. One of the pressing ethical questions of today with regard to genetics and atomic research is whether we think we can do something we are then obligated to do it. The real question should be whether what we propose is ethical in the larger sense, not whether or not we can do something. This missing element of the ethical of the ethical is a value that can only be properly understood in the Indian context. European civilization has a determined and continuing desire to spread its view of the world to non-European countries. Within, within a generation of the conquest of Mexico, the Spanish had founded schools in Mexico City for the education of indigenous youths. An important part of the mission activities for the next 300 years was the education of both young people and the adults in the Christian religion and the niceties of European customs. French colonial policy di uh, dictated a kind of education in which prominent families within the Indian tribe and the French colonial families exchanged children for a short period of time. This was to ensure that customs would not would be properly understood and civility between the two groups would not be violated by thoughtless or ignorant actions. English education represented first by the benevolent members of the atrocity who gave funds to support Indian schools and later embodied in the U.S. government's encouragement of mission activities among the frontier tribes represented and still represents an effort to affect a complete transformation of beliefs and behavior of Indians. <laughs> Education in the English-American context resembles indoctrination indoctrination more than it does other forms of teaching because it insists on implanting a particular body of knowledge and a specific view of the world which often does not correspond to the life experiences that people have or might be expected to encounter in some modifications and with the considerable reduction in the intensity of educational discipline, the education that Indians receive today is the highly distilled product of Christian slash, slash European scientific and political encounters with the world and is undergirded by specific but generally unarticulated principles of interpretation. Because the product is so refined and concise, education has become something different and apart of the lives of people and is seen as a set of technical beliefs which, upon mastering, admit the pupil 
to the social and economic structures of the larger society. Nowhere is this process more evident than the, in the science and engineering, fields in which an increasing number of American Indian students are now studying. Education today trains professionals, but it does not produce people. It is indeed not expected to produce personality growth in spite of elaborate and poetic claims made by some educators. We need only look at the conflict, confusion, and controversy over, over prayer in schools, sex education, and the study of non-Western societies and civilizations to see that the goal of modern education to, is to produce people trained to, a, to function within an institutional setting as a contributing part of a vast socioeconomic machine. The dissolution of the field of ethics into a bewildering set of subfields of professional ethics further suggests that questions of personality and personal values must wait until the individual has achieved some measure of professional standing. This condition, the separation of knowledge into professional expertise and personal growth, is an insurmountable, uh, insurmountable barrier for many Indian students. It creates severe emotional problems as students seek to sort out the proper principles from these two isolated parts of human experience. The problem arises because in traditional Indian society there is no separation. There is, in fact, a reversal of the sequencer in which non-Indian education occurs. In traditional society, the goal is to ensure personal growth and then to develop professional expertise. Even the most severely eroded Indian community today still has a substantial fragment of the old ways left, and these ways are to be found in the Indian family. Even the badly shattered families preserve enough elements of kinship so that whatever are the experiences of the young, there is a sense that life has some unifying principles that can be discerned through experience and that guide behavior. This feeling, and it is a strong emotional feeling toward the world that transcends beliefs and information, continues to gnaw American Indians throughout their lives. It is singular, singularly 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 instructive to move away from western educational values and theories and survey the educational practices of the old indians not only does one get a sense of emotional stability which indeed might be simply the impact of nostalgia but viewing the way the old people educated themselves and their young gives a person a sense that education is more than the process of imparting and receiving information. Indeed, that it is the very purpose of human society and human societies cannot really flower until they understand the parameters of possibilities that the human personality contains. The old ways of educating and affirmed the basic principles that human personality was derived from accepting the responsibility to a contributing member of a society. Kinship and clan were built upon the idea that individuals owed each other certain kinds of behaviors and that if each individual performed his or her task properly, society as a whole would function. Because everyone was related to everyone else in some specific manner, by giving to others within the society, a person was enabled to receive what was necessary to survive and prosper. The worst punishment, of course, was banishment as it meant the individual had been placed beyond the barriers, beyond the boundaries of organized life. The family was not, however, the nuclear family of modern-day America, nor was it even the modern Indian family, which has, in addition to its blood-related members, an FBI, undercover agent, an anthropologist, a movie maker, and a white psychologist looking for a spiritual experience. The family was rather a multi-generational complex of people and clan and kinship responsibilities extend beyond the grave and far into the future. Remembering a distant ancestor's name and achievements might be equally as important as feeding a visiting cousin or showing a niece how to sew and cook. Children were greatly beloved by most tribes, and this feeling gave evidence that the future was as important as the, past, as the present or past. 
a fact that policymakers and treaty signers have deliberately chosen to ignore as part of their of the Indian perspective on life. Little emphasized but equally important for the information of personality was the group of other forms of life that had come down over the centuries as part of the larger family. Neo-shamanism today pretends that one need only go into a sweat lodge or trance and find a power animal. Many people, Indians and non-Indians, are consequently wandering around today with images of power panthers on the backs of their minds. But there seems to have been a series of very early convents between certain human families and Pacific birds, fish, grazing animals, predatory animals, and reptiles. One need only view the several generations of Indian families with some precision to understand that very specific animals will appear in vision quests, sweat lodges, trances, and psychic experiences over and over again. For some reason, these animals are connected to the families over a prolonged period of time and offer their assistance and guidance during times of crisis during each generation of humans. Birds, animals, plants, and reptiles do not appear as isolated individuals any more than humans appear in the guise. Consequently, the appearance of one animal suggests that the related set of other forms of life is nearby, is willing to provide assistance, and a particular role to play in the growth of human personality. In the traditional format, there is no such thing as isolation from the rest of creation. And the fact of this relatedness provides a basic context within which education in the growth of personality and the acquisition of technical skills can occur. There is, of course, a different set of other forms of life for which each human family and so dominance and worthlessness do not form the boundaries between the human species and other forms of life. Education in the traditional setting occurs by example and not as a process of indoctrination. That is to say, elders are the best living examples of what the end product of education and life experience should be. We sometimes forget that life is exceedingly hard and that none of us accomplish, accomplishes everything we could possibly do, or even many of the things we intended to do. The elder exemplifies both the good and the bad experiences of life, and in witnessing their failures as much as their successes, we are cushioned in our despair of disappointment and bolstered in our exuberance of success. But a distinction should be made here between tribal and non-tribal peoples. For some obscure reason, non-tribal peoples tend to judge their heroes much more harshly than do tribal peoples. Tribal peoples expect a life of perfection and thereby, par and thereby partially defy their elders, at least they once did. Today, we watching, today, watching the ethical failures of the non-Indian politician, sports hero, and television preacher, it is not difficult to conclude that non-tribal peoples have no sense of morality and integrity at all. The final ingredient of traditional tribal education is that accomplishments are regarded as the accomplishments of the family and are not attributed to the world around us. We share our, fa we share our failures and successes so that we know who we are and so that we have confidence when we do things. Traditional knowledge enables us to see our place and our responsibility within the movement of history as it is experienced by the community. Formal American education, on the other hand, helps us to understand how things work and knowing how things work and being able to make them work are the marks of a professional person in this society. It is critically important that we do not confuse these two kinds of knowledge, be, to confuse these kinds of knowledge or exchange the roles they play in our lives. The major shortcoming in American institutional life is that most people cannot distinguish these two ways of knowing, and for many Americans there is no personal sense of knowing who they are, so professionalism always overrules the concern for persons. Today we see a great revival of traditional practices in many tribes. Younger people are bringing back 
bringing back crafts, songs, and dances, and religious ceremonies to make them the center of their lives. These restorations are important symbols of sense of community, but they must be accompanied by hard and clear thinking that can distinguish what is val valuable in the old ways from the, from the behavior we are expected to practice as members of the larger American society. In this movement, it is very important for younger Indians to take the, the lead in restoring the sense of family, clan, and community responsibility that undergird the traditional practices. In doing so, the next generation of Indians will be able to order, will be able to bring order and stability to Indian communities, not because of their professional expertise, but because of their personal examples. Okay, the next chapter is chapter six. It's called The Schizophrenic Nature of Western Metaphysics. And that, I'll read that tomorrow. So we're on page 47, and we're going to be reading that uh, tomorrow. All right, see you later.